Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Um, I'm going to here to talk today about uh, radar. Radar has played a key role in uh, military capability for the U.S. and many nations since the late 30s, and we're here today to celebrate one of the milestones of the collaboration in this area, the 1940 Tizard mission to the U.S. and Canada. The Naval Research Laboratory has been central to the rich history of radar development, and this talk provides a short retelling of this history of, of the development at NRL. Uh, first of all, in, in preparing this talk, I want to acknowledge in particular uh, the assistance I have from uh, Dr. Angelina Callahan from the NRL History Office. She's here in the audience uh, in preparing this talk. Uh, in the telling of this story, there's a number of recurring themes that should be apparent. The key role played by NRL in the early developments of radar and the importance of the sharing of ideas and results. This sharing and teamwork, so evident during World War II between close allies, continues to be as important today as it was in 1940. Many of the stories told here required a coordinated team effort between defense laboratories, sponsors, universities, companies, and even close allies in order to provide the end product to the nations. That was true in 1940 and it remains true today. The NRL story begins during the early years of World War I when in May of 1915 the British ocean liner Lusitania was sunk just off the coast of Ireland. The loss of many lives had a profound effect on the nation. Thomas Edison penned an editorial in the New York Times at the time, a few weeks after the sinking, arguing the case that, quote, the government should maintain a great research laboratory to develop guns, new explosives, and all of the technique of military and naval progression without any vast expense, end quote. The Secretary of the Navy at the time, Josephus Daniels, on Edison's urging, then shortly thereafter established the Naval Consulting Board, which was formed with 22 initial members, 11 National Science and Engineering Societies. The, the members were from 11 National Science and Engineering Societies. Edison was asked to serve as chairman, and um, among those on the board besides Daniels and Edison, as pictured here in the photo, were, were Teddy Roosevelt, Jr., the future Secretary of the Navy, and Franklin Roosevelt, then Assistant Secretary of the Navy and future President. The board's first meeting was in October 1915, just about one century ago uh, this month. The board proceeded then to draw up plans and budgets for the creation of this new Naval Laboratory. And although Congress acceded to the request of the board and appropriated funding for the laboratory creation the following year, it would take seven more years for the laboratory to actually be established. World War I had intervened. NRL was established and opened its doors on July 2nd, 1923. At its founding, NRL was formed in part by transferring Navy research engineers from other naval commands and bureaus. Uh, and, and, we're gonna, and one of the key people that was transferred was Albert Hoyt Taylor, who I'm going to talk about. Uh, but as recognized by many at the time and recounted by historian David Allison, Quote, creating a device that used radio waves to detect objects was an idea conceived independently by a number of early radio scientists. It first occurred to two Navy engineers in September 1922, end quote. Then at the Naval Air Aircraft Radio Laboratory in Anacostia, Albert Hoyt Taylor and Ye Leo Young were working to identify new communications channels for the Navy with their radio sets and were conducting experiments at 60 megahertz near Haines Point in D.C., they were using a 50-watt tube and a new separate super heterodyne receiver based on the new design from a year earlier by Edwin Armstrong. As they were making observations on propagation across the Potomac River, they noticed fading in and out of the received signal strength, and it did not take them long to realize the fading was due to a ship coming up the river. Taylor and Young were excited about the possibilities of this discovery. So Taylor then subsequently sent a letter to the Navy Bureau of Engineering proposing that HF radio could be used to detect enemy ships and to ask for further funding support. Uh, he received no reply. <laughs> he thus went back to work on the all-important field at the time of radio uh, communications and radio propagation. Albert Hoyt Taylor and Leo Young were both then transferred to the new Naval Research Laboratory in 1923. By the 1920s, researchers in the U.S. and the U.K. were leading the world on experimentation and theory related to radio propagation. Notable researchers of this era included Kennelly, Heaviside, Appleton, Bright, Tuve, Taylor, and Fulbert, both the latter two from uh, NRL. The focus on radio propagation continued for the remainder of the 1920s. 
Both NRL and the UK researchers were using radio propagation measurements to theorize about the structure and va variability of the ionosphere, which greatly impacted the HF propagation. By the end of the 1920s, NRL researchers were collaborating with UK National Physical Laboratory researchers on radio communication and standardization. In June 1930, Leo Young and Lawrence Hyland, both in the NRL radio division, were again working on, our, on radio DF systems, direction finding systems, when they discovered the variation in signals due to planes flying into Bowling Air Force Base. They realized it was the same phenomena has been, as had been seen with ships in 1922 by Taylor and Young. Interest in this radio detection opportunity was, uh, was immediately rekindled. This time, however, the Bureau of Engineering was convinced to start a radio detection project at NRL. The 1930s then saw a number of important radio detection concepts, key components, and key experimental demonstrations of equipment to use radio waves to detect targets. As documented by many historians, and as Dr. Merrill Skolnick wrote in his historical paper, 50 Years of Radar, published in 1985, quote, although it is hard to precisely to define a precise date for the origin of modern radar, its serious development began independently and almost simultaneously in several countries of the world during the middle 1930s. Skolnick went on to observe that, quote, each of these countries then went on to develop and deploy some form of military radar during World War II, end quote. The initial developments in, done in all of these countries was done in secret and without the, the knowledge of work elsewhere. The term radar was coined shortly thereafter by two, two U.S. naval officers as short for radio detection and ranging. Under the leadership of Albert Hoyt Taylor, the then superintendent of radio division at NRL, a number of radio division staff were focused on this new effort. Louis Gebhardt, Arthur Varela, Robert Guthrie, Robert Page, all shifted from working on radio communications projects to working on radio detection problems. Robert Page, who had joined NRL in 1927, fresh out of college in Minnesota, would go on to solve many of the practical problems of adapting the idea of radio detection to naval applications. During this period, the electronic components and subsystems for radio detection and ranging were significantly improved. The NRL researchers recognized the need for an RF device that could permit both transmit and transmitter and receiver to be attached to the same antenna. This was problematic at the time because the trans when the transmitter was turned on, the receiver would be overloaded and generally fail. Absent such a device, all installations of radar equipment would require two antennas, one for transmitting and one receiver. This was not only a matter of reducing the number of antennas needed from two to one, but it also would eliminate the errors which occurred as a result of inadequate calibration of the pointing directions of separate antennas. Such a device is today called a duplexer. Page came up with a working model of a duplexer, which when combined with the development of pulsed radar, achieved the needed requirement. This duplexer shown here in the figure in the bottom left, at least the 200 megahertz version, provided the degree of isolation needed and was a solution to that particular problem. It was the case then and certainly remains the case today that advances in electronic components often enable significant advances in the systems that use them. Other key advances made at NRL during the 1930s included the first Identify Friend or Foe system in the U.S. model XA, X, the XEA, pulsed radar altim altimeters, and improvements to tube-based transmitters and receivers at the VHF and UHF frequencies used in many of the experimental radar sets. Uh, and I'll add, so the microwave radars had to await the Boot and Randall magnetron that was brought by the Tizard mission. They had thought about microwave radar, but there was no n insufficient power sources to be able to make it practical, so work had not been done on the microwave 10 centimeter sets. During this period, the laboratory also established key working relationships with both RCA and American Telephone and Telegraph Company, and both companies would be instrumental in the development and production of radars during the war. The focus of much of the radar work by Page and Varela in the mid-1930s was on the development of shipboard radar. The first at-sea demonstration of the prototype was in April 1937 on the USS Leary, a destroyer. Key to the operational effectiveness of this radar were the pulsed operation and the use of the duplexer technology I mentioned previously. These, these enabled the use of the single antenna for both transmitting and receiving. After an initial disappointing test at which early models achieved only 25 kilometer range against air targets, Page and co-workers 
developed a new ring amplifier circuit using iMac 100 TH tubes at 200 megahertz in pulse configuration. They took ham radio tubes and run them, ran the pulse at greatly exceeding the, uh, the plate dissipation rating of the, that would, were used by the amateurs. This achieved much better performance, yielding ranges of 77 kilometers for air targets and 16 kilometers for, for ship targets. Following the successes on the Leary, Page and co-workers installed the XAF radar on the USS New York, BB-34, shown here on the right. And there's a restored version of the XAF antenna that's just up the road at uh, the National Electronics Museum. And Mike Simons uh, uh, from the museum is here in the audience. Over the next two years, NRL worked to improve the XAF radar and prepare for its production by U.S. industry. Following the radar demos in 1939, Admiral King, who was then commander of the Atlantic Squadron, predict, quote, the XAF equipment is one of the most important military developments since the advent of radio itself. Its value as a defensive instrument of war and as an instrument for the avoidance of collisions at sea justifies the Navy's unlimited development of the equipment, end quote. Follow-on production versions termed CXAM, the CXAM radar, were subsequently developed by RCA based on the NRL XAF designs. This radar found widespread deployment to U.S. ships and played a significant role in the war effort. In his final report on the war, Admiral King noted in regard to CXAM that, quote, radar of this type contributed to the victories of the Coral Sea, Midway, and Guadalcanal, end quote. Admiral Har Harold Bowen hosted the Tizard mission at NRL in the fall of 1940. We've heard uh, some of the previous uh, historians talk about uh, Bowen and, and the Tizard mission. As described in this history of the Tizard mission, uh, Dr. Zimmerman notes that at this first meeting between technical experts at NRL, quote, both sides soon found themselves enthralled by the descriptions of each other's research, end quote. Attending the meeting from NRL were Admiral Bowen, director of NRL, Albert Hoyt Taylor, then superintendent of radio and radar divisions, Commander Briscoe, and Dr. Hayes, who was superintendent of sound division. The Tizard mission scientists in attendance were the technical experts assigned to the mission, uh, and the people that came to that very first meeting at NRL were Fowler, Crossman, and Drabble. The British were intrigued by the duplexer and immediately recognized the significance for their own radar sets. The NRL scientists were particularly intrigued by the British description of their ASV airborne radar and the cavity magnetron, of course. It was apparent to the NRL leadership the value of the cavity magnetron and the impact it would have on radar, set, uh, radar sets in the microwave bands. The cavity magnetron developed by Bruton Randall thus enabled a leap into the centimeter part of the spectrum with sufficient transmit power and the narrower antenna beams afforded by higher frequency operation. The cavity magnetron would see many decades of use as a radar technology. Key to the rapid fielding of the technological breakthroughs, key to the key to the rapid fielding of the of the technological breakthroughs was the engagement with the U.S. industry. And Admiral Bowen arranged with the British mission at the, at the time that they would subsequently have ac access to the research and production facilities in the U.S. companies. Then as now, the development and production of radar sets for the end user, the warfighter, often required a team effort between the defense scientists and engineers and the companies able to productionize the designs and then produce them in sufficient quantities and at a sufficient rate to impact the war effort. Following the Tizard mission, the NDRC set up the radiation laboratory at MIT in the fall of 1940 to focus on exploitation of the cavity magnetron for airborne radar development. NRL worked through the war years in this new team effort with UK and Canadian scientists and with the newly formed radiation laboratory for the war, Allied war effort. For all of his leadership during the war and in the, th in the 30s and the war years, Robert Page, uh, who came up with a lot of the uh, key uh, breakthroughs, at least in the NRL radar in the, in the 30s, was recognized with the Disting Distinguished Civilian Service Award uh, shown there in the picture. After the Tizard mission, the collaborations ramped up, and as Drury writes in his World War II history of NRL, quote, British members of the British mission were frequent visitors at Bellevue, which is the part of D.C. that where NRL is based today and has always been, or at the material bureaus, gaining firsthand knowledge of American devices. Naval officers representing the Naval Research Laboratory were assigned to the American mission, and civilian scientists from the laboratory divisions made occasional trips to England. A two-way exchange of scientific reports was continuous, 
Production models of all important instruments were likewise exchanged. Similar arrangements with Canada, New Zealand, and Australia were enforced throughout the, the war." End quote. Referring to combined research groups, airborne radar, Loran, high-frequency direction finders, and sea rescue radios are further examples of the close research teamwork between British and American scientists which did so much to affect the joint victory. Commonalities with the UK facilitated exchanges of technologies and technique. For example, CXAM was very similar to the UK shipboard radar, CHL. In his War History of the NRL, Drury reports that when the curtain was lowered and American scientists were allowed to examine British weapons, both sides were amazed at the similarity of the technical devices devolved, developed independently. As a crash project, NRL adapted the UK ASV airborne radar, <coughs> removing its antenna and replacing it with the NRL duplexer and a smaller antenna, yielding the ASC radar. The smaller antenna was greatly, greatly increased potential airspeed and, this airspeed, and this made it possible for hundreds of airborne radars to transition quickly to field use. There was no US counterpart to the UK airborne radar in development. However, using the UK, the NRL uh, UK ASV radar as a stopgap, NRL, NRL was able to adapt the transmitter and receiver from a 500 megahertz pulsed altimeter, giving it the duplexer system NRL had developed and the two directional antennas developed at the UK. This XAT radar, further called the ASB radar, when it went into production and pictured here on this uh, aircraft, the ASB radar was the first radar de deployed on carrier-based uh, aircraft and the first deployed on U.S. night fighters and was very effective against submarines because it widened the area that could be covered on, by patrol planes. The MIT, MIT Radiation Laboratory also contributed significantly during this period to these air-to-surface vessel radar developments using the cavity magnetron brought by the Tizard mission and focusing, of course, on the, the 10 centimeter versions. Although the establishment of the Rad Lab by NDRC in 1940 as a result of the Tizard mission was viewed with some consternation at NRL, in the, in the later years, Robert Page came to the belief that it was a wise and necessary move. At the working level, NRL scientists worked together with the MIT Rad Lab scientists on the development of many improved radars, airborne radars, resulting from the use of the cavity magnetron. The radar division at NRL continued its many developments in the years following World War II. In the late 40s and 50s saw the development at NRL of monopulse radar. There was work carried out in many areas in which NRL contributed significantly. It is impossible to recount in this short talk all of the contributions made to radar by NRL and also by other organizations, government, industry, and academia. The field of radar, born in the 1930s and provided with a real push in the 40s from the Tizard mission, and the new focus on the military value of this important technology would continue to expand in many directions for decades to come. Radar would forever be a part of the, na the nation's national security. In 1956, NRL researchers concluded a set of experiments which showed that the ionosphere was sufficiently stable for HF Skywave radar to succeed for over-the-horizon aircraft detection. We heard in the talk on hyperbolic navigation how they had used the Skywave path for for the long-range Loran, the idea came about in the 50s to actually make a radar using the Skywave path. HF Skywave radars utilize the ionosphere for refraction <coughs> and transmission of the beam back to Earth following the scattering by the, by the target. Following the scattering by the target, the receive beam is also scattered off the ionosphere back to the receive site. The Madre radar, shown here on the left, was built at NRL's Chesapeake Bay detachment site in 1961. Page and James Hedrick played key roles in this radar development. Madre stood for magnetic drum radar equipment, the name given at the time as a result of the new technology for recording the received signals for later processing using magnetic drums. In the fall of 1961, Madre began detecting air traffic on the North Atlantic air traffic route and beyond the conventional radar horizon. In subsequent years, other HF radars were built by many in the U.S., in many cases tapping the HF radar expertise at NRL. Today, the technology remains important, and the Navy's TPS-71 Rother radar is currently performing this air surveillance mission as it provides wide area surveillance coverage of the Caribbean. In the decades that followed, the many advances in defense electronics, phased array radars, digital electronics, digital signal processing, 
tubes, or as they were known in the 30s and 40s, valves, and as they're known now, vacuum electronics, as well as the advent of solid state RF power amplifiers, all began making a significant impact on radar systems. This impact is still being felt today as these technologies all continue to make significant uh, advances leading to improved radar performance. Other advances made during the 60s at NRL, which I don't have time to go into detail today, but what NAV Spacer, a system to detect satellites in orbit, uh, improved IFF and some early ballistic missile defense radars. During these years, NRL continued to have a, a key role in radar development. Under the leadership of Dr. Merrill Skolnick here on the left, uh, who was appointed superintendent in 1965, the division played a major role in many new developments. Inverse synthetic aperture radar was a focus, as was work on non-cooperative target recognition. The division continues to deliver key technologies to the fleet, including the SARDIS target ID system and a number of other systems. The continuing need for improved periscope detection radar for the fleet resulted in the Automatic Periscope Detection and Discrimination, or ARPID, project, a joint effort between NRL, Naval Air Warfare Center, China Lake, and Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab. Many of the signal processing approaches validated by this ARPED demonstrator in the, in the late 80s and the 90s eventually evolved to the fleet radars produced currently by, fleet, by U.S. industry, the SPS-74 radar for the current carriers and the APS-153 radar for the Navy's MH-60 Romeo helicopters. There was also significant work on ECCM in response to the increased threats posed by adversary ECM or jamming. And much of this work, uh, many of these areas continue to uh, receive considerable attention today as they have for the past several decades. In the decades that followed the Tizard mission, radar, of course, has become a really big business with many new organizations and companies playing very significant roles, not only in the production but also in the conception and the development of ideas. So we've gone from a, a, a principally governmental uh, period in the 30s into the modern era where Many people are players. As a couple examples, during the past several dec decades, the laboratories continued its role in radar research and development, and, and time constraints today permit the retelling only, only of a few brief vignettes from this history. One, one of the stories is the SPQ-9B development. Uh, in the early 1990s, uh, th and this development remains certainly important today as, as, a, uh, as a model for uh, future developments. In the 90s, it was uh, realized that a new radar was needed for ship self-defense against anti-ship cruise missiles. Dr. Ben Cantrell, then a branch head in the radar division, took on this problem in the, 90, in the 90s in a development effort which would eventually be designated the SPQ-9B in production. He led a team in the development of an advanced development model, or ADM, for the SPQ-9B to demonstrate the capability of a high-performance pulse Doppler radar. Following the demonstration of this ADM model at NRL's Chesapeake Bay Detachment Site, NRL and NAVC PEO IWS worked with U.S. industry to develop the production version and to deploy it to the fleet. To this day, the radar division continues with this team effort with, with NAVC and with the prime contractor for this particular system, Northrop Grumman, to inject new technology into this fleet radar as required by the evolving operational challenges. In much the same manner as 50 years earlier, the laboratory demonstrated the experimental radar system and then transitioned the prototype to industry for production. In the 1990s, the laboratory made an organized effort to develop high-power millimeter wave radar. This effort involving both the NRL Electronics S&T Division and the Radar Division had as its objective the development of, high, of a high-power 94 gigahertz, or W band for those that like band designations, uh, radar for a variety of possible Navy and DOD missions. Sponsored by ONR, the project led to a development of a number of powerful tube amplifiers called gyro amplifiers. The highest power amplifier was a gyro klystron, which shown here on the left, uh, produced 100 kilowatts of peak power and 10 kilowatts of average power at 94 gigahertz. Other wideband gyro TWT amplifiers were also developed. Following this development, the team developed an experimental radar named Warlock. They are also on the left side of the picture to demonstrate the capabilities of such a system. First operated in 2001, this experimental radar achieved 94 gigahertz operation with 100 kilowatt power, demonstrating a number of key technologies. 
The NRL effort eventually saw no transition to Navy applications at the conclusion, but the new capability was recognized as a game changer for space surveillance, and much of the technology was transitioned to a large program initiated by MIT Lincoln Laboratory for the upgrade of the Haystack radar to W-band. This new ra radar, named HUSER for Haystack Ultra Wideband Satellite Imaging Radar, shown here on the right side, basically used the technology that had in part had been developed at NRL uh, and demonstrated in the Warlock radar, again showing the value of teamwork and collaboration. Today, HUSER is operational and provides Air Force Space Command with radar imagery of satellites in orbit. You can see an example from the top of that, the, the difference between an X-band image on the left, there's a small NASA satellite shown in the middle, and for this compact range data, the image quality from an X-band, narrow-band image versus a W-band image on the right. So very important technology. This retrospective began with the description of HF propagation work by Taylor and Young in 1922. The importance of understanding propagation phenomena and its importance to radar operation continues to this day. In the century since the early experiments of the U.S. and U.K. scientists on HF propagation, there has been a steady improvement of digital electronic signal processing, RF components, and our understanding of the environment in which radar signals propagate. This can lead to new applications, new understanding of what is possible, and new opportunities for joint allied efforts. One such modern-day example of this continued importance of allied S&T cooperation uh, is, is this project here, which is a collaborative effort between the U.S. and Canada, now jointly engaged on looking at HF propagations in the polar region. And the, the challenge basically is that much less is known about the ionospheric conditions in the auroral region and in the polar cap region near the North Pole. And so this is a, a basic research program to try to understand HF propagation uh, that's being carried out jointly between the two organizations, DRDC Ottawa, and the ONR NRL team under the TTCP MOU. So radar systems today remain a key part of the national defense and radars of one type or another are found on almost all military platforms. The technology developed in the 30s and given such a boost by the Tizard mission found its way into countless civil and commercial applications. Radar is becoming ubiquitous, right? You can buy cars with radars in them now. So today, together with industry and academia, the Defense Laboratory remains an important part of the team, and collaborations remain a key to this day as they were in the 40s. The field of radar is continuing to see new innovation on a regular basis, with advances in electronics, software, antennas, and many other disciplines all contributing to this continuing evolution of this important technology. There remain many challenges, of course, and there are also have been many successes and some of these successes must await the 100th anniversary of the Tizard mission to be told. Thank you.